Hello and welcome to Booklust. I'm Nancy Pearl. My guest today via Zoom, although I am at Folio in downtown Seattle, is Kathleen Flanagan, and we're going to be talking about her brand new collection of poetry, Post Romantic, just published by the University of Washington Press. Kathleen, thank you so much for joining us via Zoom today. Thank you for inviting me, Nancy. This is a big thrill. Well, I thought we could maybe start the interview with you reading um, one of my favorite poems from the new collection. Um, maybe either the one Magritte or, or the one called Maiden Ladies, whichever you prefer. Okay, why don't I start with Maiden Ladies? Okay. Maiden Ladies. They were plentiful back then black hatted in museums of natural history, staring into yellow dioramas of basilisks, swaying so as not to be confused for displays. They paid their dimes on rainy afternoons to sit with 10 year old boys watching films about Brazilian snakes and Madagascan bats and could be counted on to inform shop clerks of shaped shameful declines in quality to order special extra plain undergarments, unappetizing cuts of meat and okra tablets to jam their feet into witch's shoes that made their ankles swell. Then hats went out of style. Shop clerks started talking back and the maiden ladies died. They're not even in museums. <laughs> What was the what was the impetus for that poem? Well, I wrote it while I was reading a book of Marianne Moore's collected letters, and she was a wonderful, um, strange maiden lady. Um, and it just made me think back about some of my memories from childhood of of women that I knew or my mother knew, and I came into contact with. And since I was low to the ground, I would notice things like they had very swollen ankles or their shoes were extra ugly, like they'd be black and and sort of, you know, they might have a heel, but they'd also have ties and right. and this sort of fascination with that. And and the realization that we don't have anyone like that anymore. It's not a judgment call. I'm not saying that I, you know, I think the world is worse because we don't have them. It's just, a, it's just a change. We have changed, and that's just a tiny little marker of the fact that the world I grew up in is not the world I live in now. Well, I think one of the reasons I, I, I liked that poem so much is that I'm currently reading a whole binging on reading a series of uh, detective mystery novels uh, by Patricia Wentworth, all featuring a maiden lady named Maud Silver, who, whose clothes are, are just described in every single book. And the author says in the book how ugly the clothes are, but Maud Silver is such a good detective. I mean, there's like 30 of them, and that's all that I've been reading um, during this this it's a bad time. Um, I'll have to look her up. That sounds perfect. Yes. yes. And um, the King County Library has, uh, I think, almost all of them on um, uh, as an ebook. And Magus Bookstore in downtown Seattle has many of them on the shelf because I saw them all there yesterday. What drives you to to write poetry? I know you said you came kind of late to poetry to writing poetry, reading poetry. What what led all what led up to that if you'll share that with us? Sure. Well, I actually have a degree in civil engineering and I I um, went through a master's degree. Uh, we and I was working as an engineer and then I kind of pulled back because we were starting to have a family. So I had two small children at home. I wasn't working and I needed something for my brain. <laughs> And I read, I, I checked out from the library a couple of books of poetry, which I hadn't done in years and never, I don't think ever done on my own, you know, of my own volition. You know, it's like, I'm going to do this on my, mm -hmm. you know, 
my set of rules. And if I don't like a poem, I'm going to turn the page and I'm not going to judge myself for it. And I was about 32 at the time, I think, so old enough to trust my own instincts. Something about the timing and being on my own and, and wanting to have an intellectual life while I was caring for very small kids, it just all conspired and it created this real passion for first reading and then responding to what I was reading with by writing my own poems. And I'd always liked writing, but um, this was the first time I'd ever kind of trusted myself just to have fun, play with it, experiment. And then I took a night class in poetry and fell in love with that. And it kind of guided some of my reading. And so the more I read, the more I wrote. And and it, it just filled a spot in my life and continues to. There's something about this idea of ex finding expression for what's inside. And um, I both love to read poetry because it's a way of experimenting with other people's lives. It's like stepping into someone else's shoes and seeing a world I wouldn't otherwise ever know or meet. And and that idea of the reverse, which is that I can tell someone else what it is like to be me, to, to stand in my shoes. And that feels like a conversation. Um, so for me, writing and, and reading are, are completely intertwined. Do you who are some of the poets that you read back then that made you want to write? Or who are some of the poets that you read now? Right. Well, uh, the very first poem that took me to the library was actually a Walt Whitman poem out of the cradle endlessly rocking. And it was just a little piece of the poem that had been quoted in a and an album that I was listening to. And so I wanted to hear, I wanted to read the whole poem. And then when I was at that library, like I checked out the book of Theodore Redke and I just loved those poems. I loved that he was from the Seattle area or, you know, had, had taught here for a long time. Um, pretty early on, I discovered El, uh, Elizabeth Bishop who really spoke to me. Um, I was reading poems by Stephen Dunn who was writing about the contemporary experience in Dunn. kind of, yeah, I was going to say Stephen think. Dunn is is one of my all time favorite poets, and um, and I he gave me reading, yeah, reading the poems gave me permission to write about my very very ordinary circumscribed life, mm -hmm. and I think before I started reading those contemporary poems, I hadn't realized. I had anything to write about. I thought it had to be about a Grecian urn or, you know, have <laughs> some kind of super uh, inspired genius idea about what's around me, like Robert Frost. I mean, if you read Robert Frost and you're never gonna, you know, and that's all you read, you probably won't write anything for the rest of your life because it's so untouchable in some ways. Right. It's so perfect. Or at least not write anything that, that rhymes because right, right, he was such right. a- so reading some, uh, you know, more contemporary poets and finding more and more of those, I realized that my life could be the stuff of poetry or that my insights could be small and ordinary and domestic and I would still have enough to work with. And, and that, was, that was a discovery for me. I was interested that you were um, an engineer before coming to poetry because one of my, um, I used to, when I first came to Seattle, I spent a lot of, of, of time visiting various book groups um, to talk to them about the library and everything. And one book group that I visited that I've never forgotten, and I just loved the women there, were, they were all Boeing engineers. And we t we're talking about the book, um, uh, we, were t we were talking about a particular book, and I said, well, what is the significance of the title of that book? And it, it, their responses were all very, um, just very straight. The title meant what the title meant. There was no greater you know, depth to what the title was. Um, and I, I, I thought, you know, I, I thought about that old saying about, you know, you never met a four that you liked or something, you know, something similar to that. So that's interesting that you could be, you know, have that part of your mind, um, that engineering part, and yet 
the other poetry part. Right. I'm not sure how good an engineer I was. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really liked the, the people that I worked with, and I, I, I thought the work that I was doing was important. I was working in environmental engineering, and so I think that's a very important field. Right. But I don't think it was a good fit for my um, interior life. And I, I think this fits me much better. It's mm -hmm. that idea of finding depths inside something like a title, I think is just endlessly fascinating to me. Right, right. When you were appointed, one of, one of the things that you've done in the last few years is become the poet laureate of the state of Washington. And that involved back when we could travel, um, a lot of traveling around the state. And could you describe what that experience was like for you? Oh, it was fantastic. Um, so I was uh, doing the Poet Laureate work from 2012 to 2014. And um, it's a wonderful program in Washington State, a, a fairly new program. And one of the things that I love about it is that you're able to uh, create your own you know lane and you can you can follow the direction you want to go so for me i was especially interested in working with third fourth and fifth graders um because that's the level i love to teach i love working with kids and then the other thing i wanted to do in part because i grew up in eastern washington in the tri-cities i wanted to visit all the counties in the in the state and so that in that way be sure to hit some of the really rural small areas in eastern washington so you know i worked at that time that was kind of a new idea at the time it's now it's sort of been grandfathered in so everybody has to do it <laughs> but at that time i i used a library at the state library offices they sort of gave me a consultant librarian and she was fantastic. She let me, she, she showed me how to get into some of these really little areas and she gave me contacts. She gave me librarians in small, small areas. And I discovered that how important the libraries are to small communities, that they really are the heart and soul of the, of the cultural life in a small town. And um, I have some of my all time favorite memories in my life are of just like driving over highway two to get to um, Pullman or, you know, Moscow or Moscow, Idaho, or, you know, that those kind of trips I took on my own. And then having someone on the other end of those trips expecting me and having a role to play and having people to meet the combination of going places I hadn't gone or hadn't been in a long time on my own and then having a, a role was just a brilliant combination for me. And I just loved every single minute of it. One of the things they say is I, I didn't get sick one day <laughs> in two years because I didn't have time. And because I think I was just, you know, I was just up that whole time. How did you introduce the poetry to the third, fourth and fifth graders? Well, I, I work with writers in the schools, so I, I use their model for teaching in the in the schools. And what I usually do is I bring in a poem, maybe one poem by an adult, an adult poem, not something for children. But then I read it to them. We talk about it. I ask them to notice things about it. And then we use that poem as a model for their own writing. So there may be some element of it. Maybe it's a repetition in some of the lines, or it's the mm -hmm. subject. Maybe it's a poem about turtles, and we're going to write about turtles today. Or, or just um, showing them examples of similes or metaphors. There's so many ways you can look at a poem and talk about it. And I feel like I have it's sort of a two-prong approach, which one is to, to look at this poem and talk about it in ways that are not frightening. And then to try to convey to these kids that they what they notice is just as important as what I notice. And to try to instill this idea that poetry is not scary. And it's something you can enjoy on your own terms. And very much like when I was reading as a, you know, 32 year old and deciding to read it on my own terms. And that's how I feel how we can develop a relationship with po poetry. Mm -hmm. With your new book, Post Romantic, um, 
I, I once spoke, was talking to a poet who was telling me how much, how much um, work it took for her to put the poems in the book in the right order. And somehow that had never occurred to me. I mean, I don't know whether I thought you just threw all the pages up in the air and whatever order they landed in, that's the order of the, uh, of the poems in the book. <clears throat> did, you have a, did, uh, did you have a problem? Well, maybe not a problem, but w was that something that you were concerned about, the absolute correct order of the poems? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Although, Nancy, I have to say that there are poets who do exactly what you talk about. In fact, Marvin Bell often says he throws his poems up in the air in whatever order they come down, that's the order they're going to be. Oh, so okay. that, is, that is a real, that's a real technique. I feel um, a little better. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and that's definitely like the, the Wallace Stevens school is, you know, it doesn't matter what order the poems are. But the more contemporary um, philosophy is that the book is sort of the last poem. You know, it's the order of the book determines how you read it. In fact, very famously, Ted Hughes changed the order of Sylvia Plath's book in order to make it a, have a lighter rather than more, you know, desperate ending. So that's an example of how ordering right. poems really make a difference. Um, so I did think a lot about how these poems talked to each other, and I might use a connection that no one else would notice, but I would. One, one that I think about is that there's a poem about one of my sons pulling out an imaginary sword out of an imaginary stone. And he's, we're talking about the blade of that sword. And then the next poem is about a helicopter at Chernobyl. And it's talking about the blades of, of the, the rotor of the helicopter. And so that, you know, they're, they're kind of talking to each other. They're, absolutely miles apart in in meaning and content but they they do have that strange little connection to each other and so i am trying to do that with the poems i don't have any sections which is another thing that poets think about a lot is whether mm -hmm. i want to have two sections or three i don't have any sections but i do think about it moving as though the mind is moving between memory and current day um, so i'm trying to mimic that idea of the the mind is sort of moving and mulling. Does a, does a poetry editor, um, the, say the person who you worked with at the University of Washington, uh, do they, do they c comment on the order? Is that something that, that people do? I am very lucky because I'm working with Linda Beards, who is a, just a genius and a wonderful editor. I mean, she's a fantastic poet, but she's also a wonderful editor. And that was one of the things, the first time she read the manuscript, she commented that the order was right in some places, but not in others. And so she asked me to go back and rethink the ordering. And she gave me just, you know, three or four sentences of ideas. And that was enough that I worked for another six months on the poems themselves, but also how they are working against and with each other. So that definitely she had a big role in how I ultimately came up with the ordering of the, of the poems. I interviewed Linda so many years ago, back in the, the aughts, I think, or even bef yeah, in the aughts, I, I think, and that she is a wonderful poet. And I didn't realize that she was doing that editing, poetry editing work um, at, at UW Press. Yeah, for 20, 20, my book is the 21st book in the series, and she's wow. edited all of them. So it is, it's a, a calling. Would you read the poem in the book um, uh, uh, about George Marshall, George C. Marshall? Absolutely. Please. So um, this poem is based on a very, very early memory of mine. Um, I was kind of, <laughs> the joke in our my family of origin is that I was sort of an afterthought. <laughs> I'm quite a bit younger than my older bro brothers. Um, so in my, my bedroom, my nursery, there was this picture of General George C. Marshall that was there. And uh, so that's where that, this comes from. George C. Marshall, author of the Marshall Plan's left ear. In childhood, in the half light of my door ajar, the general's portrait on my bedroom wall glowed 
and his left ear grew by borrowing light from a white stripe in the American flag behind him, transforming it into a kind of receiver or spying device that tapped my dreams. So I was afraid, but my father hesitated to take the picture down, explaining it had to do with saving Europe after the war. This is what I understood, my fear budging against my father's love for a man who merged at night with the stars and stripes, something to do with allegiance, something to do with light and dark. You recently wrote an essay um, uh, about patriotism and about that, that poem and that picture. Could you talk about that? Yeah, I have felt so powerless this year, as we all have, and confused by how, what I can do sort of in response to it. And so I found that just by sitting down and writing about this word patriotism, which I find actually very hard to say, um, just about the word itself helped me sort of get some things off my chest. And I think sort of connected to parts of this book. Much of this book is about family life and about marriage, and it's about love and long love and a kind of a mature vision of love. But part of that mature vision is looking at my love of country. And so there are poems in this book that, that hit on patriotism. Uh, when I was reading, um, when I read the essay, I, I, I thought about those lines by Bertolt Brecht, which I'm probably going to mangle because I don't have them in front of me, but those four lines that go, um, will there be singing in the dark times? Yes, there will be singing in the dark times. They will be singing about the dark times. Does that resonate with you or does it? Absolutely. I think um, we are in a dark time and we can still love our country and hold it to account at the same time. And um, we can still be creative and love our lives even in the dark times. And I think it absolutely speaks. Um, would you read the Magritte poem, which, which I thought was a really, um, which I loved partly because it does speak to a long marriage. I think. Yeah, yeah I, I think a lot of these, I, I'm much less interested in this age of my life and stage of my life in the very simple love poem about, you know, you're wonderful, you know, <laughs> I think you're the best thing ever. I mean, that, that to me only goes a very thin distance. And um, I'm way more interested in poems that are reflecting sort of the, the, the dark and the light again. So. That, that's where this one comes in. And it starts with that image. There's a Magritte painting of men that are sort of suspended in the air, or they're either dropping or they're rising or they're just staying. Of course, you don't know what it is, but they're with their their very official, you know, soup coat and, and umbrella sort of appearing. Compare the movement of swallows with Magritte's matrix of businessmen carefully spaced and hovering in the sky, who move not at all, but might. A characteristic of swallows ready to swoop or suddenly plummet, though this is also nothing like Magritte's men, suspended in middle age, who may drop like leaky helium balloons or escape into the vanishing point, but will not acknowledge how desperate you are for something to happen. And by you, I mean me, framed in a doorway, Magritte repeatedly painted empty. The swallows last evening dragged behind them my meanings with hooks that hurt even in recollection, a tug I can only describe as my life. Magritte's men are unfastened from the air, poised to rise or fall or disappear if they just decide. And by men, I've meant all along my husband in the yard where he fails to hear me calling 
or hears me and stands facing away, utterly still. I, I could identify with that poem. <laughs> I thought that was just, I, I, I loved that poem. And, and don't you think that that's what we look for in the poetry we read is some, some sort of connection that goes beyond the words themselves to this, this feeling that we just somehow grasp, this sort of inchoate feeling that comes through. That's what I, that's what I read poetry for. That's uh -huh. no and I think in this time when we are really struggling with identity and mine and yours, this idea of crossing the divide and seeing, oh, this poem you wrote about the situation, the situation is utterly different, but I can completely identify with your response to it. That's how I would respond to. There's, there's both. There's the, your life is very different than mine, but I can see myself in your response. And I think that is what I go to poetry for. Do you go to, do you go to prose for a different reason? Yeah, I think I, well, I, I mean, I am also looking for lives in, uh -huh. in, in novels. Um, but I think in a, a novel, that long form, it's, it's sort of just taking me on a journey. I think of that as, as like a real escape from my life. Um, poetry is just this little form. It's, it's a very different thing. It's a dipping in and out, in and out. And, and novels, I, I often will listen these days. I, I do a lot with with listening to novels and I go out and walk for long periods of time. And it's like, it's, it's just like, I'm, I am literally walking into another world. And I find that, especially in this pandemic year, that has been very, very healing to be able to just leave this world and go somewhere else for a while. Well, I have to say that's exactly what I do with novels is go for long, long walks and listen to them. And I choose books that are as unlike um, where and when we're living uh, as I possibly can. So once, I, so I go to fantasy or I go to historical fiction for that kind of escape. Yes, yeah. I'm just, I'm reading Ya Gyasi's book, Home Going right now, uh -huh. and it's so beautiful and such a long, long, long way from this world. Right. Her new book is, is really wonderful as well and, and very, very good to listen to. I think you'll probably enjoy that a lot. Do you work on poems? Do you have several poems going at once that you're that you're thinking about or Yes, I I am very very slow to finish poems. So I'll they'll be in different stages. I might have one that's quite fresh and then one that might be a month or two old. And then maybe a couple more that are six months old. And then I may have a couple that are, you know, like a couple of years old. And I just pull them out every once in a while, see, because I know they're not done yet. Mm -hmm. And so I, I often have them at different stages. Well, Kathleen, I want to say thank you again for being on the show. Um, it was so great to have Kathleen Flanagan as a guest on Book Lust, and um, I highly recommend you take a look at her brand new book, Post Romantic. Thanks, Kathleen. Oh, thank you.